What's up, guys? And welcome to the Coffee with Sam podcast, episode number 20. I'd like to thank everyone who has watched on YouTube or listened on Apple Podcasts. This is 20 episodes deep. I thought this was just going to carry on <laughs> during lockdown and that was it. But we've got a good view base and a good fan base, so let's keep it going. Today's episode is sponsored by BGU, Building from the Ground Up. So for all my cheerleading followers, Building from the Ground Up is the UK's leading educational company. They do level one to level six cheerleading qualifications, and they have just brought out a new cheer strength qualification, and module one goes live this Saturday. And that is taught by yours truly, covering all things from muscles, joints, flexibility, mobility, and how you can use these important muscles and joints to prevent or help uh, decrease uh, injury rates and increase performance. So let's get into to the, let's get in to today's. I still can't say that one, guys. Let's get in to today's episode. Today's guest is a good friend of mine. I went to school with this dude. Haven't actually seen him for about 10 years. This is going to be the first time I get to see him on this video podcast. He has served in the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards. Sorry for all you military guys if I get any of these phrases wrong. For nearly 10 years, he's ranked a Lance Sergeant. He's done tours of South Sudan, Kenya, and Bruni, Brunel, we'll ask him when he get, comes on in a second. It says, welcome into today's guest, Josh Hubbard. <laughs> welcome to the show, Josh Hubbard. Thank you for coming on and having a coffee with me. Are you back home now? Yeah, mate, yeah I'm back home now. Yeah, I've got a week off. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, mate, yes, and then I've got a week off again at the end of, uh, the end of August. Bro, you're not even working. I thought this like military thing was. Yeah. <laughs> you were there all the time, and it was hard work. <laughs> it is, mate. Trust me. <laughs> no, to be fair, I get more time off than than school teachers, mate. I get honestly that much time off. I suppose, um, you, but it has its ups and downs. You served your time, though, mate. You've been there where you were stuck there and not coming home at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You deserve. Well, it. It's, well, saying that, I still have weekends where I don't come home. About three week, three weeks ago, I was. Back at work for two weeks, so oh, and um, so yeah, it still sw swings and roundabouts, mate. But yeah, it's not too bad. Um, I'm actually pretty excited uh, to get into this, and it's something different. Um, and that's what I'm trying to go with the show. Is I'm trying to go keep cheer because obviously things that you've done in your life, mentality wise, uh, fitness wise, will be able to help with cheer. But I want to try and go away from it and talk to everybody. So for the viewers and the listeners. Give a, I've done you a sick intro, but give me a yeah. brief introduction to why, why you chose the military as your career. So the reason I chose the military, uh, like anyone when I was a teenager, I, know, I still don't know what I want to do now. Um, didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. Um, went to college for a couple of years, knocked it on the head, sacked it. And then um, we got a mutual friend, actually, David Walton, who we went to school with. Um, I knew he was in the army, um, but I didn't know what he'd done. So I looked him up on Facebook, seen what he'd done, Googled the Grenadier Guards, um, seen some videos on YouTube. I was like, yeah, that's it. That's what I want to do. I knew he'd been to Afghanistan. So I was like, yeah, I want a piece of that. Something exciting. So quit college um, and then started my journey there. I got there when I was about 21 years old. Um, yeah, 20, 21, I think I was. Um, and yeah, it's been exciting ever since. And I think it's a better life I would have had. Yeah. Um, training. Um, so yeah, a carpenter wouldn't have took me uh, around the world. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to, to get involved. You, a little bit of excitement. You, so you trained as a carpenter for, that's what you were doing before you said, you know what? Yeah, I'm so for two world. years, yeah. So like you say that you've yeah, jetted off around you jetted off around the world and you've toured and stuff. Um if our connection gets bad, Josh, just say and we'll just pick back up again. Um Yeah, no, it's it's, it's all right at the minute. 
Yeah, sound. So you said you've toured the country, the world. Is there not a speck of, I could die? There was, in, at, at the beginning, <laughs> before I understood what the army was, I was, before I joined up, um, and I told my parents, um, my dad was all right about it, my mum was very nervous. Um, and I, it's strange, I was Googling, like, how common is it to die in the army and blah, blah. <laughs> and I came across this tip that it was, uh, like a dog getting hit by a bus in a busy street than you are in the army. And as soon as I read that, I was like, yeah, good to go. No problem. I'll sign on the dotted line. Um, so in that aspect, it's actually, it's just like any other job, really, apart from yeah. you do go to different parts where there is a small aggressiveness towards you. Um, but in the big grand scheme of things, no, not really. So was you, like, when you first, how does, how does the military work? Like, once you've signed up, how long is the training before you get thrown into that, go out there on tour? Yeah, so guards training is slightly longer than other line infantry. So in the guards, you do 28 weeks, so it's just over six months. Um, and once you've done, so when I was going through training, that was like the height of Afghanistan. So that was literally what was bred into us. That was, you're going on tour, the Grenadier Guards, my regiment were going on tour um, mid-2011 um, or to the uh, mid-2012. And that was going to be my sort of time to then come out of training and go straight overseas um, on Herrick. Um, so that's what all my training was geared up for. Um, and out of the, I think there was 52 of us that started training, there's only like 13 of us that actually passed out at the end of the 28 weeks. So they were quite ruthless back then. Um, obviously numbers going over to go and fight overseas. Um, but obviously when I, I passed out of training, got to my incremental company and that was still at the forefront. Yeah, you're going to be going, you're going to be going, you're going to be going. Um, and then never went... <laughs> which literally has ruined my mentality for it. I feel like, um, like imposter syndrome is what followed me from my career just by that one, one move of not being able to deploy overseas on that sort of, of a connect tour. Um, okay, so explain for like people like me who hasn't got a clue what, what you're talking about, to be honest. Like, do you mean as in like the tours you've done haven't been... Do you mean like war? Is that what you mean? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, because we all, obviously, Af Afghanistan was very war fighting, um, as you lot would, would have seen on the, uh, the YouTube videos, the documentaries, um, and how it sort of phased out into um, more of a mentoring sort of role. Um, and the tours that are around about now, they're more sort of um, United Nations tours going out, uh, helping the local population, force protection, um, yeah, we don't, assisting. We, we don't have any wars so, anymore. We don't have wars anymore. The big dudes yeah. just say, I'm going to press the big red button and then someone backs down. That's yeah. all we have now. <laughs> yeah. Just, like that, yeah. Just, just like, <laughs> well, I've, got, I've got bigger weapons than you. Okay, cool. We won't have a war then. Sound. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So the tours you did do, like South Sudan, Kenya, and I didn't, the, what was the last one? I couldn't say it right in my intro. Oh, the deployment to Brunei, yeah. Brunei, that's this it. This is Mal Mal Malaysia. So what were those three tours then, like, if they weren't war? So my first deployment was to Brunei. Um, that was a, uh, a company-level exercise. So that was literally when I first got to Bataran. That was about 2013, that was. So that was my first overseas deployment. And um, that was six weeks. That was in the jungle. Um, and that was literally just a training exercise just to... Uh, pretty much just develop your jungle training skills. And it's more of an interest as well. Um, instead of, you, you, you tend to do the same sort of exercises in Brecon, in Salisbury, so all UK based, and they'll get quite boring. So when an, an exercise, an opportunity to deploy over overseas to a jungle environment comes up, um, it gets everyone quite excited. Um, I mean, we spent five weeks in the jungle and we had a, a week, so the sixth week we had R&R, &R, which is rest and recuperation. And we went to a little place called La Buan, um, which is absolutely amazing. They've got like, it's only a tiny little island, um, but they've got like five star hotels. They've just got literally everything. It's like a little paradise. Um, so we got let loose there for four or five days. Dude, just um, selling the military to everyone listening or watching like, here. Like, I thought it's like yeah. dirt, guns, mental fortitude and... It's like, well, you it might is. go, you might go and look after, you might go and look after another country, or you might just go run around yeah. in the jungle for a week, and then you get a week off. 
pretty much, yeah. I mean, you you got you got to work for your for your time, huh? You got to work for it. I think I only remember the good times. <laughs> I try and blank out the bad times. Yeah, you're right. Like you're win, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. going on about that, like. When, when the, tra- what's the training like? So I, I see, and everyone else to me would see the training is like hardcore, men- like mental, you got to have good mental strength to get through any of the training, even if it's not going to be needed further down the line. Is the training as strict and as uh, mentally draining as, as we think it is? Yeah. How does it be nowadays? And try and change it to make it slightly more um appealing to the sort of generation that we've got at the moment but there is still that massive element of it needs to be tough it needs to be tiring it needs to be obviously taxing on the on the brain and the body um but like anything you get introduced to stuff slowly so you won't just go straight for on week one day one you won't just go straight for a five mile trainer run or a, a, a five mile tab with 20 kilos on your back Everything you're introduced to, such as weapons, is all at the lowest possible level. And then it's just built up over the weeks and months that you're there in training. And even when you, you finish training, you're still continuing to, to build that sort of um, skill. It, being in the is a skill, so that's what you're building. Um, but yeah, the, the mental side of things with, uh, with the military. So they've got a thing now called mental resilience training. Uh, so it's like MRT. Um, that the instructors get it taught to them and we, we disseminate it to the, to the recruits. Um, but I thought it's quite interesting. So one of the guys that actually take the mental resilience training um, is a colour sergeant now. Um, and he was actually part of, um, well, he's, he's, he's in the Royal Irish. Um, and he was part of a small patrol that was actually captured in Sierra Leone back in um, like the early 2000s, 2003, I think it was. And they were captured boys and they were tortured, there were a lot of mock executions, um, sorts of a degrading, horrible sort of stuff. And the way that, the one thing that come across to me about him was he just laughed it all off and shrugged it off. So he was even saying like when there was one of the, the West Side Boys gang members coming up to their prison cell to potentially kill them, mock execution um, and whatever else, looking in there and goes, oh, who's next? And I just think, how can you do that in that sort of situation? But that's what got him through it. And I imagine that's what gets quite a lot of people, is humour. Finding the funniest thing in the darkest, darkest places, I think. Um, and that's well, one I, thing I, I laugh my way through life, me. mate. <laughs> yeah, I, I think just, that's the best way. I was laughing my uh, way through life. So, like, yeah have, you, have yeah, you, have you met some interesting people like that? So, like... I know I, I don't agree with what you said that you feel like you're uh, an imposter syndrome. That's not your fault. You put yourself out there. You haven't. You haven't. Yeah, no, yeah, of course. You haven't, you haven't like just left the army. You haven't like gave up. You haven't walked away from it. You just haven't been needed when you were in there. So I wouldn't agree yeah. with that. That's that's not your fault. Have you met some think, cool people though? Yeah, def- yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't go to some of the stories. Uh, over on oh, that would be for, for another time. But um, yeah, um, but the imposter syndrome, I think it's quite a common thing, especially with my my peer group, because obviously that's what, especially good, I've got two, three good couple of friends that I was in training with. We all went through it together. We was all expected to go. Um, and I think they all feel the same. Um, it's weird to feel like that, but I think, yeah, and I, I imagine quite a few people feel like that just in general yeah. day-to-day life in job roles they're in. I get it, like, I get it. Like, you signed up for war and you want to have war stuff. Yeah, that's it, yeah. We know, we know when you have a proper war story, you don't normally talk about it. Um, but you want to have that, I've been to war, but I can understand where that comes from, but you shouldn't feel like, unless you're someone who's backed away from it and tried to hide from it, then you shouldn't really feel that way. Um, yeah. I get it though. Do you, do you kind of, are you happy you've never been deployed like that or are you? No. I mean, if I'm honest, if a conversation comes about of what I do, if I'm speaking to say um, a family member I've not seen for ages, I'll try and tend to stay away from saying I'm in the army or if I meet new people, I probably just won't even say it. <laughs> that, just because that... that's the first thing people think about, oh, did you go to blah, blah, and you're like, no, and then I feel like I have to explain myself, and obviously, like you say, you shouldn't, um, 
But I'm sure I'm not the only one that feels like that. Yeah, well, like you said, the way the, way the world is going, fingers crossed, war should slowly disappear. Yeah, yeah. The so military will only be needed to sort protests out and to go and sort countries out, like, as in, let's go and help you. Like, uh, fingers crossed, that's the way you want it to be. Yeah, yeah of course. You don't yeah. want none of this shooting each other anymore. It's <clears throat> stupid. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not the best way to get something solved, is it? <laughs> no. I do know, though, um, which you didn't tell me, but I do know you were a guard at Buckingham Palace, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so that's why that's, I still am. I'm in the, in the guards, but... No, I, um, oh, so that's, that's what the Grenadier Guards is. Yeah, the Grenadier Guards, yeah, yeah. So I think that's sick. Let's talk about that. I think that is... So, when, when I saw your picture a, few, a couple of years ago, and obviously I, we hadn't seen each other for a long time, I didn't really know what you were getting up to, and I was like, dude, he's standing outside Buckingham Palace being one of those yeah. guards that you normally go and torment. Like that is yeah. a, a cool thing. <laughs> Let's get into the serious side first. Like, how cool was that for you? It, initially, it was it was brilliant because um, that's the first thing. So when you come out of training, um, obviously you, your training's geared up to it. You do a lot of ceremonial drill, um, and uh, so when you come out of training, you go to an incremental company, which is so ours is Nymagen Company, which is in Wellington Barracks, which is literally opposite Buckingham Palace. Um, so you spend between a couple of months to a year there, depending on if the regiment needs you to push forward and fill numbers and, and what, what, um, whatever. So that's your first sort of role is ceremonial. So, so there's a barracks opposite Buckingham Palace. Oh, I lost you. Oh, I lost you. Yeah, Wellington Barracks. It's where literally about, a stone's throw from Buckingham Palace. Dude, there's just houses around there. Let's have some secret. It's kind of blended in. To, to the like houses. Secret it's army just, shit. Yeah. Off, you guys just come running out. Da 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 da. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that's what I, did. I didn't even know. I just thought that was just houses around there. Yeah, no, it's a big barracks. There's um, there's three regiments that are there. So you've got the uh, the Scots Guards, the uh, the Coltrane Guards, and the Grenadiers. All their incremental companies that are based there. No, wouldn't have nothing do. ever happens like right outside of Buckingham Palace. Yeah. Yeah, so that's just a, just a stone's throw. And that's obviously where you live. Uh, I lived yeah. there for nearly a year. And obviously you're living in central London as a young lad. It's a, it's a great place to be and, and, you know, pop in and out from into the surrounding area. Um, yeah, a lot of money spent and um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of alcohol consumed. <laughs> you're, you're definitely selling the military, 100%. I might even change yeah. careers. Um, <laughs> Yeah. What was that like though? Like, cause obviously, when you're in the military, you are protecting your country. But what's that like, protecting the queen, like our queen bee, man? What's that like, standing protecting her? It's 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 kind of a surreal sort of thing, actually, because you even though you are and you can't physically see her at the time, you know she's in the palace. It is quite a strange, um, a strange feeling. There was. Um, one time when I was on Windsor Castle and they've got a post out the back, which is by the Long Walk. Have you seen Windsor Castle? And they've got the big massive path at the back that yes. goes for about two, yep. three miles. So there's a post right at the back there and that's the Queen's residence. Um, so I was on there one day and uh, I was, I'd been there for about an hour and a half. So I was just like, oh God, I literally couldn't wait to get relieved in about a half hour. Someone's beating down on me. And uh, I seen someone coming past on a horseback. And I was like, oh my God, who's that? And she was like hunched over slightly, just like riding the horse with a little little mac up, uh, little hood mac up. I was like, oh my God, it's the Queen. I was like, Jesus Christ, it's the Queen. I was like, I best, <laughs> I best present arms to her. So I quickly come to attention, presented arms to her, and she just turned, looked at me and just waved. And I was like, Jesus Christ, that's the Queen. And I was like, that's pretty good. Cool. <laughs> just went back to standing at ease and she just trotted off on a horse. Um, so that's that was the story. If people say, you in the, what, what do you do? I'm in the yeah. military. The queen waved at me, bro. Like, that is the story I would be telling. Yeah, it's, I mean, she, she waves. So when you do, like, street lining um, or a guard of honour, there's, like, you and how many of the 100 people that are in that guard? And obviously she comes back and she waves. That's but the- that's to a collective of people. But it's, you know what I mean? That was, yeah, that was quite cool. It, it shows that it's still there. So you did what was morally right to stand at her attention for her. And mm. she didn't just rock past and be like oh that's he's only a random person standing to attention for me like he's protecting me and she said thank you yeah. and that shows how morally like she's still she yeah she, uh, she's re- yeah she respects what you're doing for her like she's got to do yeah, she, yeah, yeah. 
Like if I had a which dude, is nice. If I had a dude stood at my gate, I'd wave at him every day. He was there to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's nice. I mean, she she's done it for how many years? And it's nice to know that she's not like, oh god, he's there again. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> who's that random dude in his red jacket? That funny. Yeah, it's still at my back door again. <laughs> is it? Uh, what is it? Um, what's it like? Like, is it boring? When you stood there, yeah. Oh, it's horrendous. Yeah, I mean, the first couple of times you do it, when it's a novelty, like anything new that you do, you you know, what I mean, the time flies. But when you've done it for a couple of years, or when you're in battalion and it goes back to your two year stint. So you come off operational cycle, you go on to ceremonial and you're doing it day in, day out. Cause it's quite a quick turnaround in the summer. So it's 24 hours on, 24 off. And sometimes you're literally going back on the next day and you've only come off the day before. And yeah, it's a, it's a long time. Your back aches, your feet hurt, your arms ache, you get sunburned. Yeah, it's a nightmare, is it, man. But is it true that what 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 are your powers there if something was to happen? Like, because you've only got a bayonet, you ain't got a gun, have you? Yes, yeah, so you've got your rifle. Yeah, you've got your rifle, you've got your bayonet. Um, I mean, a lot of the time, the police are the overruling sort of factor um, on a lot of the palaces. Um, however, if on certain posts, it's literally just you that are, you that's there and it will take the arm response a little bit longer to get there. But um, if someone's acting suspiciously, coming up to you, abusing you, you're well within your rights, you just ask them to leave, come to attention, um, and obviously if worst does come to worst, um, and the arm response doesn't get there in time, and something serious is happening, then you can use lethal force with, with your bayonet, but it it should, and it wouldn't, it, touch wood, ever get to that um, sort of situation. I just, I just heard, I'd heard a myth that like you guys were stood there, but you actually weren't allowed to do anything, even though you are. Yeah, of course you can, yeah, yeah. 100%, yeah. If you honestly believe that someone's life or your life's in danger, then you can 100% act upon it. That's no good, though, when you've been stood there for 23 hours and it kicks off and you're half asleep, your feet are and your back's hurting. You're like, I'm not, I can't kick off. Yeah. I'm tired. <laughs> My back hurts. So I give it a, have a day off, mate. <laughs> Just go and get your rifle up, like, ah, oh, God, I'm dying. Yeah. I'm dead. Yeah. I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. What's it, so, like you said about people coming up to you, obviously we joke about it and... As the British, that's what we do. Like, haha, they're here protecting us, but let's annoy them. Is that, have you ever had that, people in your face? Like, yeah, nine times out of ten, that's what you get. So they don't realize that you're, 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 you're serving soldiers and you're an infantry. So you are literally like a frontline serving soldier. They think that you're just employed by the circus down the road to just come and stand there for a couple of hours and just make the place look pretty. Um, and there's a lot of like misinformation out there about the guards. But like follow, um, yeah. Right. People just think that you're just following old things, and it just makes the London look good, type thing. Yeah, I mean, we are a massive tourist attraction that bring massive revenue into the capital. Um, but they are serving soldiers, and they need to be treated with the respect <laughs> that they deserve. Instead of a lot of people just tend to think, oh yeah, let's just go and take the, you know what I mean? Out well, of them. Yeah, that's the thing. Well, a lot of some of them are probably idiots that are just blind to it, but. When you get tourists, they probably a lot of them love the whole the whole queen and all that. Yeah, stuff. They do, probably yeah. they probably do think that ah oh, they're not even soldiers, but they have to try and keep up the like keep up the old. Yeah. I don't know what it's called. They think you're actors. That's yeah. another one. They think you're actors. Um, and a lot of the tour guides in London, even though that's their sole job, is to tour people around London and know the ins and outs of the places they visit and the information they give out. I'd say only say two out of the ten, say two out of ten tourist guides get it right. The other eight of them get their completely information from, I don't know where from, but they don't know what they're talking about. That'd be one thing they'd they'd explain though, wouldn't they? You'd say, oh, so this is a, what what are you called? Beef ears? No? What are they called? No, so that's that's another thing that's commonly mistaken as well. So just guards, so foot guards. So like, that you think that they'd explain that, wouldn't you? Like any tour guide and say that these are actually, that this dude could shoot you if you run upon him. Like not, you know what I mean? You think they'd explain that because that's a pretty cool thing that we still do that in, in the UK. Yeah. That the Queen still yeah. has these people you standing think there know. before. Yeah, exa- exactly, yeah. And I mean, it's quite wide, widely publicized as well if you actually, you know what I mean? If you put in a Google search, it'll come up top search. So I don't know what they're using, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I think that's a sick thing to do. And I mean, you just tell me that story about 
being waved at by the Queen, man. I would tell my kids, yeah. <laughs> everyone, like, I would, that'd be my first go-to. I wouldn't even think about that. I've never toured or I've never shot someone. Or I've never been in the army. You haven't shot anyone, have you, before? No, 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 no. Only what? BB guns. <laughs> yeah. you, gun. paint. <laughs> you, like, fired a gun, like, not just in training, like, while you've been out somewhere, like, not as it out, like, just in the street, like, but... <laughs> no, no, never. It's only on controlled ranges. Um, we've been out with obviously a load of weapons and stuff when we go on patrols uh, in certain so on operational tours, um, but it's never escalated that far. There's always so many steps before you can sort of de- de-escalate a situation before you have to discharge around, which is obviously the last, last sort of resort. And there's loads of paperwork as well that you'd have to fill out if you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So, yeah, so you were saying about like that do with the, the mental fortitude and how that they're bringing, I think that's pretty cool because that's kind of tying in with the fitness industry, the world these days, that everyone's yeah, saying is, yeah. you need to be mentally tough for everything that's going on. So it's pretty cool that the army are, I know like the SAS and all that stuff, it's all about mentality, can you deal with it? But the fact that they're trying to teach that as a frontline thing now, not just the let's break people down. Um, I yeah, it's pretty, pretty much a, I think a that's basis pretty, to sort of... I think that's pretty cool. So... You, you were saying that you um you competed in like a 24-hour endurance race? Yeah, we did, yeah, at, um, at Forney Island. It was, um, it was sort of a last-minute thing, but I did it to try and get out of deploying to Germany for a couple of weeks. And uh, hopefully I didn't have to go to Germany for a couple of weeks. So that'll be uh, a bit of time at home. But what actually happened was I'd done the 24-hour endurance race and then on the Monday morning, so I finished it on the Friday, Monday morning, still deployed to Germany for two weeks. <laughs> so I ended up doing both. You did that to raise money, right? For um, what charity was it? So, so this was for the Army Benevolent Fund. Um, so uh, it's a soldiers' charity for injured injured uh, soldiers and their families, um, which is uh, obviously a, a, a great cause. Um, I think we raised over nearly ten thousand pounds in that that particular charity event. Um, but yeah, we went there as a four-man relay team. So the way it worked was you had a mile and a half loop on an airfield. Um, only one person could run at one time. So you do your mile and a half, tag your pal, he'd then do his mile and a half, come back, tag you. Um, and you could work it however you wanted, as long as there was one person running. But obviously, you've got 24 hours to fill. So we was doing like four to six hour shifts. So in a pair, so me and my mate Jake would do um, four hours once we'd done go and get the other two, we'd go and relax, have some massages, do some stretching, get some food, and then pretty much prep for our next four-hour shift then. And we've just done that continually for, for the 24 hours. Have you done anything outside of that, like outside of it being military-based? Have you, you thought about going and doing any of these ultra races or anything like that? Yeah, I've, I've, for, for the past like two years, I keep saying, I'm going to compete in an Ironman. I'm going to do an Ironman. I'm going to do an Ironman. Right, you haven't got a bike. Right, I'll get a bike. Still haven't got a bike. Right, you need a wetsuit. Right, go get a wetsuit. Still haven't got a wetsuit. I can run. I can do the running part. <laughs> I just think, need everything else. Do you think that's you've, you've gone into that down to the training you've had, like mentally, that the way you've been broken down, you actually enjoy breaking yourself down even more? Is that why you think you enjoy endurance racing? I think so, yeah. Well, I, I really do enjoy stuff like that because it obviously... You, you sort of, when you get so far into it and it's like the, them, them hours where it's just like, you know what, I could knock it on the head here, but... You're one of those little... sadistic people that likes to <laughs> suffer. Yeah. You're one of those anyway. people like, <laughs> make you down, jump in cold showers and stuff for no reason. Yeah, I do. I do cold showers stuff. Yeah, that Wim, all the Wim Hof. But, yeah, uh, I only do that yeah. when I've had a hangover. Oh, I wouldn't do it on a hangover. Christ. I do it to like, make, cause I, I'll, I'm like, it's your own fault for doing this. Get in the cold shower and wake up. Yeah. <laughs> you made like, you need to suffer because you drank too much. It's your own fault. <laughs> oh, no, the, the cold water stuff's great, especially for like recovery and everything. Did you do a lot of that in the, in the military? Like well, after hard training or anything? Yeah, well, a lot of the time, you never really get time for it. Um, that's like in the sort of program and the schedule. So it's all literally, once you've done your whatever it is for the for the day it's it's solely on you to then go back to your room and sort of look after yourself whereas a lot of people are just happy they'll go back to the room they'll just get 
we'll get a Domino's in, sit on the Xbox, whereas a, a couple of people will actually spend the time to like phone roll, go into like an ice bath, do the recovery, and then get back on it the next day. Um, I was going to say to you, what is fitness like in the military? Is it as like, do some people really look after themselves like like we are mm-hmm. doing outside? And like the Americans, they're well into it, aren't they? Like they just want to get jacked and shoot weapons. Like Yeah, so um, so the Americans, I think it's the US Marines, they actually get paid um, extra money for proving that they can go to the gym. So that's a massive incentive for them. Even though they get paid, their job is to solely stay fit but they get extra to prove they go to the gym or not. So that's why a lot of them do like to get jacked up to get that extra paycheck, which is fair enough. <laughs> yeah, that would be sick. The, the military but, um, seems like a five-star fitness retreat right now. What this conversation has led to, we've yeah. like, walked in the jungle, five-star hotels, getting paid to get jacked. I'm going. Yeah. It's only the US that pay you to get jacked. I mean, well, I like Army America. Did, I like just, America. I like America. You get paid to be fit, don't you? So it's your job to be fit and yeah, be able yeah. to carry on your job. Um, is it, so is you, it, in the UK, is it as in-depth? Like, like you just said, foam rolling and like there's all this scientific study stuff ended up scientific. <laughs> that ain't even a word, but it sounds good. Scientific. Um, yeah, happy that. Oh, we'll roll with it. Has it, made, <laughs> has it made it into the army yet? Like, is there a lot of people are like, oh, because like you've done, you're a PT in the army right now. Yeah, that's it, yeah. So has that, do you talk about foam rolling, ice baths, protein, carbohydrates, fats, recovery, this, sleep, mentality, get good sleep and water and all that? Do you, is it, or is it just literally train hard, get smashed up with training and mentality-wise and go to bed? Yeah, you do. You, you try and educate your soldiers as much as you can, but that will literally come from you, as in the, 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 the PTI. It wouldn't come from anybody else it's down to it's your job to then get the company fit educate them on what they need to eat what they need to do to recover stretching and then obviously you'll any dramas they'll come and speak to you and you'll advise them what to do where to go um give them training programs but um but yeah the information that you get is solely from your sort of own research or if something new comes out and it gets pushed out pushed out through the pt core then it'll get disseminated to to the the oh, good. So, so, like the, 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 the guys at the top who are telling you what you need to do, they are actually educating themselves and telling you you now need to educate yourself. It's not just yeah, you. Yeah, it's constant. Like, it, yeah, so there's a bit of both. So you can use your own initiative um, yeah. and then you can, you know what I mean, if something new comes out, um, you'll speak to the core bloke who's the head PTI in the battalion, run your information or your idea past him. Uh, and if he's happy to like trial it on the company, then you'll go, yeah, mega happy with that. I've got like a four week trial on say like when CrossFit first came out, a lot of the companies wanted to do CrossFit. Um, but it turned out with doing that, it then sort of impacted the sort of um, tab inability of a lot of people and the cardiovascular like ability went down. Um, with injury doing risk. circuits. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, injury was <laughs> going through the roof. So we had to sort of mix it up with a little bit of CrossFit um on the odd circuit session but still predominantly doing our bread and butter which is going out on runs tabs um just to keep it more sort of relevant to our work really what's the tab josh a tab so it is when you are walking about with weight on is the easiest way to explain it yeah i've seen that so that's obviously fitness changes so everyone's trying to change and create something yeah. every day to be different and make money that's coming into it because obviously walking has been a massive thing and when i lost weight I was a fat kid. You saw me at school. I was a fat kid at school. Like, walking and just moving, even though I went to the gym, even though I educated myself, walking, I would say, was what I would tell anyone to do first because that's what keeps me fit now or keeps the weight off me is excess movement outside of what I do. Otherwise, I can eat and I would still be big if I trained. Like, I'd still have weight yeah. off me. Um, and I feel like it's, it's been stolen from the army a little bit, but this people are going out with weighted bags on now. And they're like, well, in this month, I'm going to do a weighted walk with what I lost last month. And then it's, I'm going to do a weighted oh, walk. I've not seen that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, cool, a lot so. of people, and there's, there's groups now. So they'll, instead of just going walking to Snowdon, it'll be, you've got to come to Snowdon with the weight of your children or with the weight of what you've already lost in a bag. Cool. You've got to keep the bag on. Do you know what I mean? Like, don't yeah. say Christ. Like you've only got, got one children. child. Don't say Christ, okay. you've got big children. 
No, I was thinking, hopefully they've only got one child. He says, Christ, a fat kid. <laughs> yeah. No, luckily, my, my, my kids are uh, still very tiny, so I think I'll be all oh, right with them. Yeah, you've got those genetics, ain't you, Josh? You're always lean at school, mate. Yeah, I was gifted, mate. Gifted. No, but like, that's, you say that you fell into the army because you knew, didn't know what to do, but if you look right back to what you were doing as a kid, it probably fed into it. Like... You always like to do certain things, or you're always moving and always active, and you're probably it was always going to go that way. Like you probably didn't just fall into it. Uh, yeah, which you're why you probably right to be fair. Which is to why yeah. you were lean. You were always active. You were always moving. You probably, if you look back, there was probably times you wanted to suffer when you were a kid. You did some random stuff, or going out on your bike for hours, and your legs were burning, and you were into that sort yeah. of suffering phase. It probably, it probably is the same. Do you know what I mean? It's why you fell into it. Like, you, you can't just say you fell into the army unless you were a bad kid and you got yeah. forced to go to the army by your parents or something. It's like old school, go and sort your life out. <laughs> yeah, like 1940s. Yeah. No, you, you, I think you're right, to be fair. Like, um, quite a few of my friends, my close friends, have said they always knew that I'd probably end up in the army through what you said, through me growing up as, um, as a young lad and going out making dens, fires, blowing stuff up. Um, you know, you name it, yeah. I, mean, so, I did that a few times when we used to blow those um, aerosol yeah. hands up. Boom! <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that was oh, so man, it takes, takes you back, doesn't it? But, took some fun trips out, being chased by yeah, the jelly yeah. men on the, on the train station. Jelly men, <laughs> mate, yeah, that's it, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it, subconsciously, it's probably always there, actually. Um, <laughs> for, and the viewers, for the viewers and the listeners, jelly men were what um, us as kids called the dudes that were telling us to get off the train tracks so we don't die yeah. in their high visits. And we used to find it funny that we just called them jelly men, then got chased by them because we found that as fun. Um, so Josh seemed to like to jump on a train track for one. That's like near death experiences and then be chased by someone. <laughs> They're trying to keep you safe. So he was definitely wanted to go to the army. Well, um, we don't encourage it, kids. So, <laughs> yeah. Don't encourage it. Stay off the train track. Enjoy yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so you're PTing in the army now. Is there any um, thought of carrying? Are you enjoying it? Where you want to carry that on into the future? When you, because how long do you have to stay in the army for? Are you there forever? Are you, can you leave? God, there's three. Yeah, it's there's like rumors you're never allowed to leave. Twenty. Yeah, you'd know, you're never allowed police, to leave. That's... Military police come and get you if you leave. Yeah, they actually do. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's 22 years, which is a long, long old time. But even when you do 22 years, you can, if you reach a certain rank, you can then extend. Some people spend 35, nearly 40 years in the army, um, which if it suits them, it's, it suits them. But um, for me, I think over the next year or so, I'm sort of like transitioning out away from the military. Um, and hopefully um, in early next year maybe sort of launching my own uh, PT business which is the big thing I want to try and launch at the minute which is what I've leaned on you for for trying to sap all the knowledge out of you that you've got from being there and doing that but yeah that's look pushing forward um, that's the big thing that I want to try and commit to and go forward with when just wing it there. <laughs> exactly that everyone everyone is isn't they <laughs> no that's cool I'm glad that you've enjoyed it that much that now you can find that transition out because like you said at the beginning of this conversation you said you didn't know what you want to do well you're doing what you want to do you want to yeah. you, you, you you don't hate the army you still want to take a piece of the army with you but you're you're ready to be at home with your wife and your, your wife married no yeah no no fiance fiance your fiance and you've got two kids one kid on the way yeah two yeah, yeah one girl, one boy yeah like you, you still want that piece of the army but you need you now need you're now prior 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 prioritizing too much caffeine mate i do this on the podcast all the yeah. time I, can't even, I normally get episode wrong and i say something else um you're now prioritizing your 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 fiance and your kids but still with that military mindset um Yes, you're not going to come out and create a military boot camp because it's been there and done that, but you're now going to pass on your mental fortitude and the way you've enjoyed to suffer and that to, to clients. And that's cool that you want to, you want to pass that on. Um, and I think it's a, it's a great thing. You say you don't know where you want to go, but you do know where you want to go. You exactly know where you yeah. want to go. Yeah. 
Um, but um, so yeah, I know where I want to go. <laughs> good man, there we go. You all heard it here first. Um, do you get many people me messaging you about the army, like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to uh, can't. Should I do this? Shouldn't I do that? Yeah, actually, yeah. Over over the years, I've had um, I've had quite a few people, family, friends, people I don't even know that have been put into in, in touch with me. Um, I don't think any of them have actually gone through and completed the sign up process and gone through it. Um, but I've never been negative about it. I've always always told them the truth. Always said you get this, this, and this. It's a great opportunity if you, especially if you're at the right age, um, especially if you if you're a young adult. It's 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 a great sort of starter in life. Um, so yeah, you still get a lot of people asking questions. Awesome. Where are you, are you okay with that? Or you like someone messaged you over Instagram or whatever? Would you happily have some time? Like not loads of time, but yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I'm, that's what my job job role is at the moment is training, recruiting, basic training. So, at the moment, I'm the best person to speak to about that sort of process and any questions anyone has got um, about signing up. Awesome. Where can people find you? Uh, find me on Instagram, um, Facebook. Uh, it's not a an actual business page. It's just no, my no. personal. No, that's Facebook. Fine, that's fine. Yeah, it's just my my personal Facebook um, page, which is just Josh Hubbard. And my Instagram, which is Josh seven. Awesome. So if anyone's got any questions, listening or watching that they want to ask about the military, not random ones like have you killed anyone before or have you shot anyone? I think we've yeah. cleared that up. But like if you're just anyone that's interested in potentially joining. Maybe. Yeah, we've, yeah, we've got I've, we've got I've got a lot of young people who will watch or listen to this, and um, hmm. Josh will tell me if you're sending him spam, and I'll I will we will find you and we will kill you because Josh is trained. Um, I'm not. I'll just follow. Um, oh, mate, I've been and also, you. what area are you living in now, Josh? So living in Polesworth. Um, that's where hometown is. Um, but I'm currently based in Catrick, which is North Yorkshire. So that's okay, where so I am day to day. So PT wise, because this sounds really funny, but I've probably got some people who watch and mm. listen to this in Catrick because I actually went. There's a big cheer yeah, team down there. Saying. I've, wor I've worked down there with a cheer team right next to your barracks. So. Where are you starting your business? So it'll be back home. So in and around the Tamworth area, Litchfield, uh, Barton sort of area. Um, so yeah, quite close to home. Awesome. So if anyone is looking for a military type PT or um, sounds or even likes the look of Josh, you know what I mean? Some people like the look of a PT. He's, an, he's a handsome <laughs> young chap. Um, get at him when he's ready to um, start his new career and launch his business. And uh, he'll be happy to help. Awesome. Well, the little one's trying to break in now, just at the right <laughs> time. She's got my Amazon parcel. <laughs> Been taught by a dad. <laughs> yeah. Military train. Yeah, What's this? Oh, thank you. Is that daddy's year of a Marto? Thank you very much, darling. <laughs> Perfect. What we ordered? Uh, yerba mate. That you had it before? No. I was, I was sick of drinking coffee, so I tried to like find a uh, find an alternative, you know, so you don't get your words mixed up and, and stuff like that when you try and pronounce stuff like, uh, what was it you are trying to pronounce? <laughs> Pri prioritise. <laughs> yeah. So I got, I got this. Oh, yeah, nice. Martin, I'll, I'll send you it over, but it's... Um, it's just a herbal drink that gives you the same sort of focus level as a, as a coffee, but you don't get that crash or mad sort of sick feeling off. Ignore him, guys, because I'm not changing the name of the podcast. It's still the <laughs> Coffee with Sam podcast, and coffee <laughs> is still the best thing to drink. Josh, yeah. you're ruining my name here. I thought you stopped recording. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. But I'm telling you, you have a mate. It's the one. Awesome. Nice to speak to you, Josh. Nice to see you as well, dude. It's been a long time. Yeah, and you, mate. Um, well, yeah, it has, mate, yeah. If you need me, um, you know where I am. Yeah, cheers, buddy. Yeah. Thanks a lot, mate. Awesome. See you later, dude. All right, take care, mate. See you later. Bye-bye. Yeah,